Let's get an update from uh, one that it's had a lot of Team USA basketball fans sweating so far today. Team USA down at halftime, down for a lot of the second half, but with under 30 seconds to go now, Team USA has a six-point lead on Australia. Carmelo Anthony has 31 points. He's been great in this game. Pass LeBron on the all-time Team USA scoring list. Nine of 15 from three-point range has eight rebounds. This one almost over. Australia putting a huge scare into the Americans. But Mike Krzyzewski looks like he's going to stay perfect in the Olympics with Team USA. Haven't lost since 2006. More on that to come. I'm Chris Hassel, just you, me, and sports. Pennant chase day baseball to get to, but we're going to begin with a scare for Team USA basketball. A 70-game, 10-year winning streak was in jeopardy against Australia this evening. Take you through some non-moving pictures of this game. Australia had four, four NBA champions on its roster. And the United States was down five at the half, down two with nine minutes left to go. But a late run, giving the Americans a double-digit win. 98 to 88, the final score in this one. The closest margin of victory, though, for Team USA Basketball since 2012. And this is a look at the fourth quarter scoring. It was all Mello and Kyrie, 26 points. The rest of the team, just two points. A couple of free throws from Kevin Durant with a few seconds left in this game. It was a game where Carmelo Anthony passed LeBron James for the most points in USA Olympic history. We are going to hear from Michael Eaves, sports center anchor who was there, took in the game from inside the arena. We'll hear from him in just a little while here on Sports Center. But again, Team USA surviving. You're the first basketball player to represent the USA in four Olympic games. Yeah, don't, don't remind me. <laughs> Does that make you feel old? <laughs> when you think about it, when you think about it. None of your contemporaries are, are doing it. You know, no. LeBron's not here, mm -hmm. and Kobe, and Dwayne Wade. They didn't, and you did. Why? Yeah, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I like it. Um, I, I enjoy learning about different players, personalities, um, not just the basketball players, but as people. Uh, and I feel like I'm kind of that bridge, that gap, you know, between the, 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 the veterans and the, the young guys that's a part of the team. You are, uh, in many respects, the face right now of social activism this summer yep. in, in the wake of everything that has happened. I didn't plan it to be like that. I mean, it wasn't a plan. It's just something that happened. Like, it was, it was very authentic. It was very genuine. Uh, because I could have spoke out plenty of times of other things that's been going on, but a lot of times you just want to wait, you know, want to wait and, you know, just see what, what comes naturally. I know that you spent some of your childhood in Baltimore. You marched yeah. in the Freddie Gray protests. You had been involved in ads uh, for gun control, but you had never gone to the extent that you did with your Instagram posts. Yeah. Uh, what is it that sparked that particular moment where you sat there privately and said, you know what, I just I just can't help it. I have to say I something. I really don't I really don't know. I was watching the news and you know I just got tired of seeing it and and I'm just like started typing and typing and typing and before you know it that Instagram post went up. Why do you think that it resonated with so many people? I think people were um, surprised at the fact that an athlete uh, of my stature stepped up to the plate and um, said something. You know, a lot of times with athletes, we are kind of afraid sometimes uh, of speaking out on, on, on different on different issues. And I think it's the platform for us to, to say something. We needed our voice to be out there. The urgency to create change is at an all-time high. You were the impetus, the opening of the ESPYs. Mm -hmm. What were those conversations like as you brought LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Paul to the stage? Well, it was, I mean, we, we have a group chat and, you know, they actually was like, we need to do something like, Melo, you called us out. You know, we, we, we have your back, we, we support you. We need to figure this out. You also, with some of your Olympic teammates, 
to continue the conversation or maybe start the conversation, yeah. right? In LA, mm -hmm. uh, you had a forum. Who was there and what do you think was accomplished? Well, both men and women USA basketball teams was there. Um, we had police chiefs, you know, from, from that area in LA. We had kids, um, you know, from the Boys and Girls Club that's down there. We had, you know, um, South Central LA. South Central mm -hmm. LA. We had um, community leaders. We had activists. We had just all type of people there. And for me, it was more not, it, it wasn't about a quote unquote town hall. It was more about a, a conversation with the youth and putting those to the youth and, you know, the, the police officers and letting them hear each other out. You know, and a lot of times that's where the disconnect comes in at because the police don't hear what the what the youth is talking about. The youth don't want to hear what the police is talking about because it's a it's a distrust and it's, it's a disconnect. What were both sides saying? What did you take away from it and say, wow, th this group learned this? I was I was more like educated at the fact that some of the, the officers that was there was like, we've never heard this before. We embrace kind of these conversations. We want more of these conversations. We need more of these conversations. So I was more kind of shocked that they didn't know. And the stories that was being told to the police, you know, about some personal stories, police brutality thing. I had a couple guys, a kid in my group who just was shot by police a couple weeks before that. And for him to step up and actually look in the, the face of a police officer and say, I don't, I don't trust you. Like that right there was like, oh. Powerful. Yeah, it was like, wow. You know, it, but we, you know, we, we got past that and it was a great conversation between those two people. And I, for me, that was like, okay, I did my job. You know, I did my job, but I needed that. I wanted that. I wanted the kid to look the police in the eyes and say, we don't trust you. I don't trust you. And why I don't trust you. What did you share from your personal experience with those kids? Well, I mean, I, I grew up in that. Uh, I, I've seen police brutality before, and I've experienced police brutality, not at that, that high level, but I, I've experienced it before. And for me, it was just easy for me to tell that story because that's what was going on right now. What do you think needs to happen going forward to really affect true change? Because your point is the system's broken and yeah. that's what we've got to fix. Yeah. My opinion is we have to put more emphasis on the school systems, um, you know, education, in-home education, um, different programs, educational programs, whether it's more rec centers, whether it's more boys and girls clubs, whether it's we need more initiatives, you know, for, for kids to take advantage of. And, we, uh, we need to be educated. We need to educate our youth because right now it's a, it's a major, major disconnect. And another point that I was making in, you know, in that conversation was the police. I mean, it's the, you know, you, you have to abide by the law. You're not the law. I mean, at the end of the day, and they was very receptive, you know, to, to knowing that. How committed are you to continuing this? I'm committed. I'm committed. And we, we got to get our youth back you know, out the streets. We got to get the community feeling back. And we need police to do that. I mean, we, we need them to protect and serve, but we also need them to kind of build these bonds back into the community because this is lost right now. How familiar are you as you go into the Olympics with the Black Power salute with what Tommy Smith and I'm very, John Carlos did? I'm, I'm very, very aware of that. That's a very powerful powerful. I actually have that picture soon as so you walk in my house, I have that picture there. Really? That, yeah, and it's way before any of this was going on, but I, I, I just look at that moment and the way that they seize that moment. Uh, and he, it's a backstory to the guy <clears throat> from Australia that's in that picture too, that was going through something in Australia. He supported them. He supported them, and a lot of people don't don't know that story. And he suffered consequences. And he suffered consequences back in, you know, in Australia, so... That's another story that I think needs to be told uh, because while we were going through something in our own country, he was going through something in his country. So it, it wasn't just about us, it was about the whole world. That was in 1968, think about that. Yeah, and here we are, 2016, and still going through the same thing. As you go to the Olympics and the platform becomes bigger and bigger, have you thought about using the Olympic platform? I've, I've, honestly, I've thought about it. Um, I just don't have the answers to what should be done. And then I'll sit back and I'll also say, okay, 
This is the biggest platform the whole world is watching. Uh, what better way than to make a statement than it is to go out there and win a gold medal and become united? That's bigger than any other protest that we could possibly do on that stage. What sense did you get seeing KD <laughs> for this first appearance there at Oracle, and now you've seen him play with Draymond and Clay uh, about how that's going to go? Well, I think they'll have an adjustment period. There's no question about it. Playing with KD is, an, as a, is fun. I've coached him twice. This will be the third time I've coached him. And actually, I almost made the Beijing team as a young guy from the select team. He's been that good. He's been with us the 11 years. And I see him grow. He's even better now because he's very competitive, a little bit more vocal, and is a good teammate. And that night, I... I wanted it to be special for him because he's very sensitive and he just he wants everyone to not necessarily like him but respect him and think highly of him. So that that decision knocked him back, I think, a little bit. And I, I we've been talking the criticism that he engendered yeah. by I deciding to happened, go with the Warriors. Yeah, one thing I told him, I said, you know, when you're really good, you're going to be criticized and you're going to be hated by a certain amount of people. Just if you're if you win and if you're really good that you know don't you might get uh, 50 letters and 49 of them say how much they love you don't let the one letter ruin it but we do a lot of times until you get a, a kind of immune to that I said so that's what you're going through now and a lot of people are not going to like you because of the decision you made I said do you like the decision he says yes I do I said well all right. You don't have to answer to anyone else. Just get, let's get over this. I thought that night helped them get over it. You know that from being at Duke. You, yeah, you, I, you, I know. You, you understand I know that. what being loved and being hated <laughs> and with people not even knowing you. I, I know that. And thank goodness, because that means we've, we've won. But, you know, we've always respected the game and people. And I, I did tell uh, Katie this. You know what? Even the people who say they do not like you, they respect you. And if they don't, they're knuckleheads because then they don't respect excellence. And you know what, man? You are excellent. You're the best. So if someone doesn't like that, that's cool. But they should respect you. And that's what a competitive person should want, that respect.